Uh, let me introduce Shannon uh, Valar. So Shannon's talk today is entitled Technologies Unpaid Debt, AI and the Promise of a More Human Future. Uh, she is the Bally Guilford Chair in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence, but also a Professor of Philosophy at the Edinburgh Futures Institute of the University of Edinburgh uh, in Scotland. So she has many publications in the field, in the broad field of AI ethics or robotic ethics and artificial intelligence. Uh, she uh, has published a book with Oxford University Press in 2016 entitled Technology and the Virtues, a Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting. Uh, she has a forthcoming book, uh, handbook at Oxford on the philosophy of technology, and she is also currently working on a new book on the subject of artificial intelligence and ethics. And I think the working title is The AI Mirror, Rebuilding Humanity in an Age of Machine, uh, machine Thinking. So uh, our main uh, research deal with the ethical implications of emerging science and technology, especially a and artificial intelligence, robotics, and new media uh, for human character and institutions. She received in 2015 the World Technology Award in Ethics for the World Technology uh, Network. Uh, and she is also, so uh, she has served as the president of the Society for Philosophy and Technology and she is the co-director of the nonprofit Foundation for Responsible uh, Robotics. I should also point out that she, uh, Shannon, will uh, be giving a second talk at the Center for Research and Ethics. Uh, well, this will all place, uh, take place online via Zoom, but organized by the Center for Research and Ethics on May 14th, 1-4, uh, entitled The Digital Besanos, AI and the Virtues and Violence of Truth, Telling. So if you want more information about that talk, you can check the Center for Research and Ethics website or send us an email and we'll give you, we'll be happy to give you more information about that second talk. All right, so it gives me great pleasure to, to, uh, to welcome you, Shannon, and to, uh, to hear this talk. So I will unmute your microphone. Great, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, that's great. So, and you, I think now you can simply start your, your PowerPoint presentation and it should show uh, in the back. So to everyone that is listening, we're sorry about all these little technical discussions. Usually when we do a Zoom session like this, both the, the host and the speaker are in the same room, but obviously it was not possible to do that given current circumstances. So Dominic, it won't let me share my slides, I think until you uh, stop yours. All right. There you go. All right, let's see here. Okay, are those showing up okay? Perfect, that's all good on my side. Great. All right, so uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for joining in. I uh, really appreciate um, all of you committing to uh, yet another Zoom meeting, uh, which we're all uh, now all too familiar with. Uh, and so hopefully this one will uh, be engaging in the conversation, certainly afterward, I think will be. So um, let me just jump in. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, try um, to get through the first uh, set of slides here, about the first 10 slides quite quickly, uh, just to make sure that uh, I don't go over time uh, I think this talk has run a little longer than I expected. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna move very quickly and we can, uh, I'll slow down in about 10 minutes and then we can um, come back to any of these slides if you have questions later. So I, I'm, I'm arguing here uh, in this talk uh, that we have allowed ourselves to accumulate uh, a burden of what I'm gonna call moral debt. And I'll explain later what, what I mean by that in the design, development, deployment, and use of AI and other new data-driven technologies. And I'm arguing that that debt is going to need to be paid down with interest. Uh, and I'll talk about what I mean about that as well. If these technologies are gonna help us deliver the more humane future that's embedded in the concept of technological progress. We talk about technological innovation a lot, but we don't always define when innovation is true progress. And I think we need to uh, begin to have that conversation. So the orientation of my work is the idea that data and AI ethics are a cornerstone of sustainable futures for the human family uh, with technology, assuming that technology continues to uh, advance and uh, become more and more of an integral part 
of our social infrastructure uh, and our institutions. Uh, that leads to a sustainable future only if data ethics and AI ethics are integrated into the design and development of those technologies. And I wanna acknowledge that we're facing some unprecedented challenges to sustaining the kinds of societies that are worth wanting. Um, and we see this uh, with the environmental damage uh, that is spreading on a planetary scale, uh, associated worries about biodiversity collapse, ecosystem fragility, resource limits in a growing population, uh, what we're all living through right now, uh, global public health threats that can travel at 900 kilometers an hour, information pollution that can travel at light speed, uh, and along with all of this, unfortunate signs of collapsing public trusts, especially in many technologically advanced countries, uh, which is particularly worrying. Um, uh, and, and we have to talk about why that is, and that's part of what this talk aims to do. So I'm arguing that these challenges to 21st century human flourishing cannot be met unless we get much better at observing and understanding our environment, our built systems, our own actions, and how all of these impact one another. And data science and artificial intelligence are powerful new tools for pursuing and acquiring that understanding. But there's a caveat. If we use data science and AI poorly, they will obscure more than they reveal. And we have plenty of real world examples of that happening already. If we use data science and AI irresponsibly, that will undermine public trust and civic cooperation while also degrading our informational and physical environments. We see examples of this as well. Data science and AI use unjustly will deprive people of their rights and opportunities to flourish. So my argument is that data and AI ethics is what ensures that data science and AI can do the work for us that we need them to do in order to move into the kinds of sustainable futures uh, that we need to build. Okay, so that's the opening. Now let's jump into uh, a, a deeper exploration of this concept of progress and its connection with what has been called the fourth industrial revolution. So here's a provocative question. Have advancements in computing remained well correlated with advancements in human flourishing? We would have expected to see that. And in fact, there are those who would give a very robust and enthusiastic yes in answer to that question. Uh, we have uh, many vital measures of social progress that have seen robust improvement in the past century. Uh, we can talk about uh, broader and cheaper access to information, increases in average human lifespan, global per capita calorie intake. And in fact, measures like these have convinced scholars such as evolutionary psychologist Steven Pinker that the arc of human progress is ascending unchecked in a way that confirms the moral triumph of modern liberal technocracies. And the shape of this arc, however, is viewed quite differently by scholars such as John Gray and others who've argued that while global GDP continues to grow steadily, and let's set aside the present economic calamity, increases in global human welfare have stalled or begun to regress over a portion of this late period. So in fact, measures of global genuine progress and prosperity, which include not only measures of economic growth, but also of social environmental health, have been declining since roughly 1978. Uh, and that's what this graph uh, claims to show. Uh, and you see here around uh, that time in the late 70s, uh, evidence of a decoupling of rising GDP from rising GPI, global progress indicators, indicators. So we need to grant that as with, with all measures, any calculus of human progress reflects the values of those who choose the metrics and the particular historical frame in which the measures are applied and interpreted. But there's several clear indications here that humanity is standing today on increasingly shaky moral, political, and environmental ground. And this was the case well prior to the shockwave of COVID-19, which places global welfare in immediate and possibly even long-term peril. What COVID-19 does show, however, is the extent to which all but a few modern technocratic states have failed to respond wisely or even competently to a threat which has for many decades been entirely predictable, indeed, even an overdue near certainty. In the lingo of American sports metaphors, COVID-19 came at us right over the plate. It was exactly the pandemic scenario that technologically rich nations such as the UK, the USA, Japan, China, 
Canada, Germany, France, and Italy had long been expecting, and which the world's leading experts in public health and infectious disease have been extensively advising us in our preparations for. If relative concentrations of technical expertise and capacity for innovation were indeed a reliable predictor of society's ability to care for human welfare, then we should have expected to see a strong protective effect for the most technologically driven nations on the planet, whose responses should have been the most rational, efficient, timely, well-coordinated, and humane. I hope I don't have to work too hard to convince you that this is not what we have seen, nor have we seen rational, efficient, timely, well-coordinated, or humane responses by these nations to the existential threat posed by global global climate change, again, a peril that announced itself on our doorstep decades ago. So our present era is frequently described as the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution, marked by unprecedented global advances in data availability, machine learning, and computing power. Yet in the midst of this information cornucopia, we now have a world where fewer people and technologically advanced nations believe in the power of vaccines or in the spherical shape of the earth than was the case in 1977, the year that mass market, mass market desktop computing was launched. So it's been 43 years since consumers in wealthy nations first brought the power of computing into their kids' bedrooms. And yet the citizens of those nations are not, broadly speaking, more reliably educated peoples. Why is it then that technological progress is decoupling from human progress if we accept the premise the considerable evidence of this decoupling has been mounting for the past 40 odd years. Why has the information revolution failed to deliver to us a greater capacity to predict, identify, and quickly mend cracks and systemic failures in our most important institutions? In the next section of the talk, I'm going to explore a phenomenon that I think may go some way toward explaining this failure. So my argument is that technological advancements, including most recently AI, have increasingly been used as instruments that permit the increasing accumulation of a society, an institution, or an organization's moral debt. All right, so let, let's talk about what I mean by moral debt. So I mean several things. Um, first of all, the delaying or neglect of the shared moral labor that an organization, social institution, or public must continually undertake in order to sustain itself heal its internal dysfunctions, maintain adequate reserves for resilience to external shocks, and steer itself intelligently toward a desirable and attainable future. Examples of moral labor uh, include a variety of forms of social care of children, the elderly, the sick, friends, family, neighbors, etc., as well as the moral labors of reciprocity, uh, provision of justice, honesty and accountability and leadership, etc. These are all forms of moral work neglect of which weakens social ties and exposes a social body to danger of dissolution. We also need to talk about the unseen and compounding social and organizational cost of a long-term strategy of relying on new technologies as patches, workarounds, and compensations for the neglected moral labor that I'm talking about. And finally, we should talk about the neglect of shared moral labor within technical systems and organizations themselves which like all social systems require such labor for their own maintenance, resilience, and sustained fitness for desirable purposes. So I'm gonna dive into that third bullet point a little bit and then come back to the others. So in thinking about moral debt in technical systems and organizations, there's a helpful comparison with the far narrower concept of technical debt. And software engineers will be quite uh, familiar with this particular concept. So, in software development, there are well-known organizational and cultural incentives to neglect the labor-intensive, costly, and time-consuming work of building software well, in favor of building software that will meet the minimum specs of the customer and be deliverable in a timely fashion and at an attractive price. The neglect of certain best practices in software development, such as clear and consistent documentation, rigorous testing and validation, interoperability by design, intuitive user interfaces, these are often, uh, sacrifices of these things are often not only viewed as permissible, uh, but to some extent even demanded uh, in order to be able to deliver the minimum viable product. After all, in the real world, nothing built can be built perfectly without consuming infinite resources and time. 
Thus, some sacrifice of the best possible practice is necessary in order to be able to deliver anything at all. So the question is not, therefore, should we take on technical debt, but how much technical debt is safe to accumulate and when will we need to pay it down? Because technical debt comes with interest, the financial and reputational cost of fixing or replacing a giant pile of undocumented spaghetti code kludges that have mysteriously stopped working for the client can often be far greater than if the developers had invested extra resources earlier in the design process. And that's to say nothing of the liabilities involved with the unpaid technical debt can be clearly tied to an unexpected failure that caused grave harms to human life or property. So um, we have this quote on technical debt from Ward Cunningham in 1992 uh, about the uh, power of technical debt uh, to break the backs of technical organizations that don't take seriously uh, its impact uh, and its potential uh, to become uh, an overwhelming burden if the interest is not paid down. Uh, there's also some interesting work that's been done on sources of technical debt. Uh, I've mentioned several of these already, but uh, feel free to take a glance at this if, uh, if the concept's unfamiliar to you. So I'm arguing that there's a connection between technical debt and moral debt, um, and it's not just a parallel. Uh, so I'm not just using technical debt here as a metaphor. Some technical debt is also part of an organization's moral debt when it consists not merely of some necessary and justifiable shortcuts to shipping functional code. Technical debt becomes moral debt when it results from an organizational and professional failure of technologists to carry out the shared moral labor of fulfilling their shared ethical responsibilities. Most commonly, these are responsibilities for product safety, preventing foreseeable and significant product harms to the public welfare, displaying honesty, integrity, and trustworthiness as a service or product provider, and so forth. So moral debt in technical systems accru accrues for some of the same reasons that technical debt accrues. The effects of technical debt and moral debt often interweave and amplify one another. One might look at the recent Boeing 737 MAX debacle as a case study for how technical organizations that previously were broadly admired for their integrity and technical excellence can collapse as a result of decades long decline in attention to technical standards and ethical norms an inattention that permits unacceptable forms of technical and moral debt to accrue until they combine to result in a disaster. A recent highly visible case of moral debt coming due in a technical product is that of Zoom, ironically enough, given our present uh, venue, whose products suddenly became a backbone of global communications and commerce and education last month, only to be exposed for having never fully delivered on many of the privacy preserving measures promised in their documentation, such as end-to-end -end encryption and being left open as a result to Zoom bombing of users and other adversarial attacks on the system. Earlier this month, their CEO and founder said of the risk to harassment and abuse, I never thought about this seriously. I want to note here that not thinking about security seriously is not plausibly read as a confession of ignorance. A founder of a commercial IT product is not unaware of the relevance of security. Rather, it's a confession of an implicit choice to delay the work and cost of intensive security-centered design and invest those resources elsewhere. To shift the shared technical and moral labor of taking security seriously to the debt side of the ledger. For AI and machine learning, moral debt is accrued when the rush to deploy tools at scale delays the necessary attention to risks of unjust bias perpetuation and amplification, the need for rigorous performance testing and auditing in the user environment, the potential harms of unexpected and unsafe results in edge cases or where real world data diverges sharply from the training environment, or the need to carefully manage user expectations and practices to prevent misuse or abuse. These are just a few of the areas of moral debt and AI that we can already see becoming problematic. The most visible examples thus far concern commercial facial recognition products, such as Amazon's recognition and Clearview AI. But we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of moral debt that AI is accruing. This is because one of the most important points to recognize about technical and moral debt is that their harmful effects are typically delayed so that the debt can reach its most acute and threatening level precisely at the moment when the organization or profession is employing, enjoying its zenith of financial success, respectability, 
public trust and or consumer loyalty, as we can see in the example of Boeing. This provides a dangerous reinforcing illusion that the strategy of accumulating such debt is not only prudent, but the key to technical excellence. It's how leaders and employees at Facebook were able to adopt and embrace the motto, move fast and break things for years without even a hint of irony or foreboding. We therefore need to bring attention to the phenomenon of moral debt in AI now, rather than remaining in a reactive mode where we react and respond to problems as they're exposed and then scramble to introduce post hoc mitigations, penalties, and redesigns. That strategy is both costly and harmful and risks leaving the public and regulatory perception of AI technology stained with associations of unreliability, irresponsibility, and lack of safety. Before moving on, however, I want to dig a bit deeper into the concept of moral debt in relation to technology. We said that moral debt is a general type of de deficit that social bodies of any kind are subject to, since all social bodies have to invest in some shared moral labor to sustain and repair themselves. The shared moral labor required to maintain a family or a democratic union are some obvious examples. But technology has a special relationship to moral debt, not only because moral debt accrues in technical organizations and systems, just like technical debt, but because one of the main ways that social bodies are able to defer moral labor without suffering immediate degradation is by replacing or augmenting their regenerative functions with increased or novel technological capacity. This is not a new phenomenon. For example, the earliest technical systems of financial auditing served precisely to compensate for the missing moral labor required to maintain trustworthy market relationships, especially at scale. As markets became larger, more dynamic, and more impersonal, it became harder and harder to carry out the intimate moral labor that could previously be performed through the exercise of local community-based virtues of friendship, integrity, reciprocity, and loyalty, combined with careful reputational policing of these ethical norms by the market community. Techniques of modern financial auditing compensate for some of this difficulty by making it possible to incentivize or enforce compliance with market rules and norms, even in the absence of moral compulsion in the community. Technologies can then function as a kind of moral extender or bridge, and they can do this in three ways. The first is by enabling human moral labor in a social body or system to be performed more easily, quickly, or effectively than is otherwise possible. An example of this might be the way in which writing, the telegram, and the telephone all served to enable people to maintain social bonds with distant family and friends who would otherwise become unmoored from our lives. A second way is to automate the moral labor so that the same activity is taken over by a machine. An example of this might be the traffic light, which takes the place of the human traffic monitor who previously served to keep people moving safely and peaceably through intersections. Note that here it wouldn't be quite right to say that the light is performing moral labor, since it can't have any moral intentions. It's just a light. But it is designed by people to do the same moral work for the same moral reason. The third way is for the technology to replace the previously performed moral labor with a different kind of labor, one that holds the social body together in a functional or healthy state by non-moral means. Financial auditing techniques are of this latter kind. While a traffic safety system still requires that people somewhere in the community express and maintain care for public safety, even if they're no longer needed to express that concern in the physical intersection, financial auditing systems don't depend on the existence of civic, mar civic market virtues like neighborliness, loyalty, reciprocity, and integrity. They are designed to foster a morally denatured version of market health. And this is an important point that we'll return to. So now let's talk about how computing technologies and more recently tools of data-driven innovation and AI factor into this picture. First, consider how computing technologies are used in a first sense as enabling. Email and later social platforms such as Facebook were quickly put to use as the latest iteration of the family and friend network maintainer, like the telephone before them. Note that neither email nor Facebook were originally created to perform moral labor, but they were quickly adapted by users to that purpose. 
An example of the second type is the design of accessibility technologies, such as text-to-speech and automatic captioning, which invite blind and deaf persons to participate in public life in ways that formerly would have been enabled by a human translator. The technology automates a human moral function, but does not replace it with a different function. An example of the third kind is the growing use of employee tracking software to monitor keystrokes, restrict bathroom breaks, and limit non-business critical employee interactions. The moral labor of skillful human management, culture building, and organizational leadership, labor which is of course always neglected by bad human managers, is not being automated here by employee tracking software. It's being replaced by something that claims to ensure employee productivity by non-moral, and in some cases even immoral means. So I'm arguing here that technical systems of the third kind, and to a lesser extent perhaps the second kind, are facilitating a dangerous and unsustainable accumulation of moral debt in human social systems, organizations, and institutions. As with technical debt, the harmful effects are delayed in their appearance and may not be visible until they've destroyed the health and function of the social body that carries them. The point is that moral labor can rarely be substituted without cost or interest that must be paid later if the social body can still afford it. I want to draw your attention to this because we've seen a growing trend in many organizations, institutions, and nations to rely upon new technologies, especially AI, to compensate for or delay the social costs associated with a decline in public and personal exercise of virtue. In many cases, this strategy is implicit. In other cases, it's, it's promulgated explicitly by governments, private companies, and academics confident in the ability of technology to do the civic heavy lifting that people refuse. That is to use technology to replace the missing moral labor of virtuous, well-cultivated citizens. For example, let's talk about the growing neglect of the elderly in many nations and the growing underprovision of human care of the vulnerable more broadly, made acute by the present economic devaluation of care work, which is increasingly mislabeled as low-skilled and low-value work. Our social deficits of care, however, are proposed to be remedied not with better training, support, and remuneration for human caregivers, but rather with AI-enabled care bots and remote AI surveillance systems, which are hoped to limit the risk of deaths and injury from neglect without actually removing the neglect by providing its opposite, i.e. care. Other than in a few limited ways, these technologies are not even capable yet of automating care. That is, a care bot cannot do very well at all in mimicking moral attention and concern or perceptively noting a subtle but worrying change in personality, or holding a comfortable converse, sorry, a comforting conversation about fearful or distressing realities, or even catching a person about to fall. Some of the more ambitious aims for AI-driven care include automation of moral care, so that would be the second sort here that we've described. But those promises have been unmet for over a decade, and comparatively scarce attention and funding has been lent to using AI to support and extend the first kind of moral labor, skillful human care work. We see a similar trend in the parallel devaluation of teaching labor, a profession that when, when done well draws heavily upon shared moral labor. Deficits in teaching and education quality are not being proposed to be remedied with AI enabled improved training or support for human teaching and human care but rather with digital MOOCs and automated AI tools for self-directed learning. So again, the strategy has been to focus on type three and to some extent type two rather than type one. Finally, what has been the strategy to save those societies whose public health and political stability are directly threatened by a sea of online disinformation and information pollution made even more damaging by the unchecked social media vices of brigading, bullying, trolling, gaslighting, stock puppeting, and other pervasive antisocial conduct at scale. The solutions sought thus far have not been moral, but technical, namely the still elusive holy grail of AI tools that can be trusted with online content moderation. And note that this is a bridge of the third type, not the second. Healthy communities of discourse have never been enabled by encouraging every type of verbal abuse and deceit, 
And then just having a massive army of conversation police run around somehow making those utterances invisible and non-repeatable. Where healthy discourses have existed, they've been enabled by a very different kind of labor, namely a complex set of moral norms that people cultivated and encouraged one another to observe as a criterion of inclusion. Of course, these norms can often be perverted to function as immoral criteria of exclusion of rightful participants. I'm not ignoring the fact that the moral work of social bodies can and often is done badly. I'm saying that where societies are healthy, the moral work is done well. And this is why we should be concerned about systematically using new technologies to bypass it rather than facilitate it. After all, how well has this strategy served digital societies? How sustainable is it? At what, at what point must we acknowledge the limits of this strategy and the urgent need to reinvest in moral capacity building for human beings who still bear the sole responsibility for charting a collective course towards sustainable human flourishing in increasingly, increasingly treacherous conditions? Have we leaned too heavily and for too long on technology to offset the growing moral debt generated by a failure to reckon with this challenge? These questions motivate a research program focused on the role and limits of digital technologies as compensations for the accumulated moral debt of societies that neglect the cultivation of public virtues. When does the initial additional social wealth generated by technical innovation function to successfully cancel or offset a portion of society's moral debt? And when does it function only as a high interest bridge loan that comes due later and increases social costs in the long run? When is it justified to employ these technical loans as a result of no available alternative? When is it necessary to pay down the incurred debts by reinvesting in the moral improvement of social institutions? And finally, how can we turn our cultures of innovation away from building extension bridges of the third type and more toward the second type or ideally the first? This is the research agenda that I'm proposing here designing new applications of AI and data-driven innovation that function to increase our capacity to perform moral labor together and to pay off dangerous and unsustainable levels of moral debt in our social systems. So what are some of the obstacles to this effort? So as I've noted earlier, one obvious obstacle is the pressure, wait a minute, uh, one obvious obstacle is the pressure that comes from excessive dominance of short-term metrics of productivity and economic efficiency that devalue the labor needed for long-term sustainability and health of social bodies and systems. But a second obstacle is the way that we've framed computing and AI as a form of expertise that is separate from social labor and values when nothing could be further from the truth. Every computing system is a tool custom built to satisfy human values of some sort or other, even speed is a value, is entirely relative to what you and your colleagues desire to happen quickly. A technology that delivers speedy death to a virus is good. Another that delivers speedy death to a pedestrian is not. Speeding up graphic performance is good. Speeding up system heating is generally not unless the system is an electronic cooktop. AI is no different. What we call intelligent depends entirely upon judgments of what contributes to the health and flourishing of life and activity with others in a range of different social environments. And if you don't know much about the latter, your skill as an AI researcher and developer is curtailed accordingly. Yet this isn't how we teach AI in most universities. We teach students in technical disciplines to focus on the code or the math and leave the rest to experts in the soft disciplines of social sciences, arts, and humanities. And that's if we even acknowledge the importance of those kinds of expertise at all. There's a parallel error on the other side, of course, whenever we teach students in those supposedly soft disciplines that technologies are somehow of a different and less interesting world than the history, politics, arts, and philosophy that co-shapes and shaped by them. So this contributes to a skilled deficit on both sides of the disciplinary breach between STEM and non-STEM education. In the AI field, it leads to researchers who haven't routinely practiced or been evaluated in applying ethical analysis to their work. 
so that even if they happen to have a great passion and natural talent for moral philosophizing, their educational environment hasn't trained them how to concretely use that talent in the AI research and development domain. And that's about as useful as having a great passion and talent for archery, but never having drawn a bow. These same patterns are repeated in the professional and industry domains, although that thankfully is starting to change rapidly. Still, there remains a relative deficit of professional incentives for investment in AI domain specific ethical skill development. What has changed is that if you do have those skills, you'll find them increasingly welcome. For example, if you go to work at Google AI or Facebook AI and you've had a lot of time doing applied research on machine learning fairness or federated learning for privacy protection, those skills will be extremely welcome and likely put to use. But it remains the case that AI researchers and developers are not yet generally expected to have an applied ethical skill set upon graduating, although I think we're moving in that direction. I see encouraging signs here at the University of Edinburgh and elsewhere that leading AI research universities are sensing the shift and moving to align their curricula with it. But probably the biggest obstacle to using AI to pay down our moral debt is the externalization of many of the costs of moral debt to third parties, end users, citizens, public institutions and commons, and marginalized or vulnerable groups in society, especially future generations. This creates a moral distancing effect, or worse, an illusion of moral solvency in AI research communities as the delayed but devastating social costs of offloading moral labor may not be visible to those who stand within various protective circles of privilege. So what do we do about this? Okay. So we have these sources of moral debt uh, in data and AI systems. How do we pay them down? So I wanna focus on a few things here and then open it up to discussion. So I'm just about done here. First is we need to remodel our cultures and accountability structures in data science and AI practice on technical domains in which innovation is still highly valued, but moral debt is less easily tolerated. So think about the domains of aerospace or aviation or civil and mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. These are all fields where the professions have learned over time, sometimes at high human cost, unfortunately, that you can't treat innovation and moral labor uh, as an either or. It's a false dilemma to suggest that we have to prioritize one at the expense of the other. In these domains, it's very clear that the shared moral labor involved in protecting human welfare is an essential ingredient in being able to drive innovation forward in a way that earns public trust uh, and uh, consumer loyalty. So we can take AI and data-driven innovation and model its culture on those previous lessons. We can also integrate domain specific and practical ethics. And I'm not thinking here about teaching moral philosophy as much as I think that is valuable. Um, I'm talking about really sort of practical skill building uh, ethics education throughout AI and data science. Not one off ethics courses that aren't seen as core to the discipline, but rather expanding the definition of core technical competence in these fields to include ethical reflection, care, and moral creativity in design. And then we also need to re-internalize the moral externalities that are being generated by AI and data-driven innovation. We need to make sure that those who knowingly or even negligently impose moral harms on AI users or on society have stark incentives not to. And that can be loss of professional reputation and career opportunity, exposure to legal or market penalties or restitution or denial of commercial success. And we need to embrace the necessity and desirability of moral solvency in data and AI practice. We need to consider that data science, innovation, and sustainable AI deployment right now are being held back more by growing public distrust, distrust and fear and a resulting lack of stakeholder cooperation than they are by a lack of good ideas or talent. So data and AI ethics is not a roadblock to innovation. It's the way forward. Thank you. That's all I have today. Uh, but I'm hopeful that we will have a stimulating discussion 
uh, after we have uh, some responses from uh, the commentators. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Shannon, thank you very much. Normally everyone would clap, but I'm uh, assuming it's a bit difficult to... Um... All right, Martin's clapping. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, but yes, thank you very much for the talk. So let me just, uh, I want to share my screen. <clears throat> I'll do that later. So let me... Okay, perfect. So now we have two uh, comments, one from uh, Cathy uh, Kobe and one from uh, Jocelyn McClure. So Cathy Kobe is the uh, Ernst & Young Global Trusted AI Advisory uh, Leader. She oversees a global team that works on the ethical and control implication of artificial intelligence and autonomous uh, systems. Just a second, I'm sorry. All right. Can everyone hear and see me properly? Oh, can you make me a sign? Yes, all right, perfect. Sorry for that. All right, so AI, uh, Cathy Kobe, for our function is to oversee a global theme that works on the ethical and control implications of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. She has more than 25 years of experience as a technology risk advisor. She's a chartered professional accountant and certified information systems auditor. Uh, she has assisted global organization in conducting enterprise risk assessments. Uh, used to ask better question and address multidimensional technology uh, issues. And so her involvement with Ernst & Young Climate Change and Sustainability Service has uh, also helped her provide assistance to client, clients in creating and preserving value by embedding sustainability throughout their organization. I should also point out that she's an advocate for women in technology, so I don't know if that will come out in her comment, but uh, Katsi, please go ahead. I will just unmute your microphone. All right. Can you, can you hear speak? me? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, thank perfect. You. So, um, Shannon, thank you so much. Um, there was so much that you said that I agree with um, that uh, only point out a couple of those, and maybe I'll, I'll use my perspective in this field to maybe add on to some of what you spoke about. Because really where I sit is that I feel the intersection of, you know, the academics, the, the policy setters, uh, the guidance setters, um, the ethicists really, and, you know, a lot of the private and public corporations, the technologists that are working to actually um, utilize artificial intelligence and data science into, for the most part, commercial operations, but also in some public sector operations for the public good. And so I'm really at the center point of trying to navigate the, the ethical imperative um, around AI and data science and the practical barriers and, and constraints and, and considerations in trying to actually achieve that. Um, and so I completely agree with you that there is really a, 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 a need for further integration of, of data and AI with ethics. Um, if you think about the way that AI is designed you really need to have so many of those requirements up front as part of the requirements of the AI design to ensure that as its objective function is being developed, as you think about setting what is the performance expectations that you have, how do you actually measure that performance in training, in the modeling, and then ultimately when it goes into production. If you don't have all of those both technical, functional, and ethical and um, a moral obligations and, and requirements designed up front, you're certainly going to have a gap in regards to its performance. And so I think that's what's really important. And I have time and time again seen data science teams, AI lab teams, have the best intentions have worked very hard on putting together an AI system and ultimately it doesn't actually move it into production because the risk and control and governance teams you know, granted came through and said, wait a second, you haven't fully thought through privacy implications. You haven't thought about the full scope of harm that this system could take. We don't know if it's in compliance with all laws and regulations. So they pull it back. And that usually delays significantly the, um, the ability of, of that AI to do its original intended purpose. And um, 
So we were really trying to be an advocate of trying to move ahead uh, those um, discussions up at the design stage, kind of trust by design. Um, but what that requires is that, and I completely agree with you of, of that there needs to be this, uh, this joint understanding of, of the AI technicians, of ethics and, and vice versa. But be honest, it's gonna take a while for that to make its way through the formal education process. Um, and so what today we're kind of promoting is multidisciplinary teams having, um, bringing in some of these ethicists and the, the most social scientists and the psychologists alongside of the AI to really have these really um, impactful design challenge sessions that can actually sit at the design table to bring up some of these broader societal and moral implications as a practical way of trying to create and open these dialogue. Um, because I, although I'm a huge proponent even for women in STEM, um, I've also said that, look, we, we can't rely on, on women to become major players in STEM through formal academia because it takes far too long and we don't have four, six or eight years to wait for them. So we need to be thinking about how can we actually engage the people we have currently today, whether in a, in a public organization or in a, a civil organization or a corporation. So how can we bring more of those people at the table as these AI systems are being designed to be thinking about how they can bring in all of these different perspectives and we can get these requirements in the design up front. Um, one of the things that I've certainly noticed is that there is a vacuum right now where um, so much of the guidance right now is in a guidance format. It is principles. It is not even standards. It's uh, not laws or regulations. Um, and so, and, and part of that is because AI is evolving so quickly, it is difficult to prescribe um, even technical functional requirements, let alone moral and ethical ones. And so it really is left with this vacuum, as you pointed out, that it is really left right now for the technologists to basically try to navigate this through some high level principles, which really are very difficult sometimes to actually put into practice. And so we need to be thinking about how we can create these practical constructs that allows us to translate those ethical and moral considerations into um, uh, something of a framework and, and, and I think what we need to realize as a reality is that it's not gonna be a prescribed um, framework. It is still going to have a very high level of subjectivity and uh, judgment required. And so again, how do we bring those educated folks to the table that can help to navigate those judgments? Um, because as, as, as I have noted in, is that AI technology is very broad. When you look at what everyone throws under that definition, um, it is very broad. And so it also makes that very difficult then to take kind of moral and ethical dilemmas and actually narrow them down to a particular AI technology. Um, and, and so we need to be thinking about how can we start getting really granular about certain use cases of, of AI, whether it is use of drones and surveillance, autonomous vehicles, use of AI in healthcare treatment plans, and really get granular about what we feel are the moral and ethical imperatives that we want to, to put in place for those kind of use cases. Um, and, and also thinking about um, how do we come to a common global understanding of ethics and morals. Part of the challenge as well is that a lot of these technologies are built for global use, and yet morals and ethics um, become less and less common the farther you move from your local environment. So 150 years ago, it was much easier when people only stayed within a you know, 20 kilometer radius of their birthplace throughout their life. And you know, so much of their ethics and moral were, were you know, by a, a very local government or you know, religion or, or community. Now on a global stage, if you just take the privacy differences we have between Asia, Europe, and in the Americas, just, just how to even try to navigate that type of, of, of differences. Um, we need to be thinking about how we can come to um, these, these um, agreement in regards to not only um, common, but also how do we navigate some of these, these differences. Um, one of the things I wanted to really um, talk about is that um, you, you spoke about the use of, of AI technology as a, an enabler, an automator, or um, as well as, as, as a substitution of, uh, and some of the, the concerns about, about doing that, as well as some of the benefits that it can have, because it can go both ways. And I think that's part of the dialogue that we need to have, is that 
AI and data science ultimately is a tool. It is a technology. It, it does not have moral imperative currently right now. We, have, we don't have general AI, we have narrow AI. And so all of its design it's, it's, um, is, is all derived by human intent. So whether that is human intent based on um, uh, conscious decisions about the intent of the technology or um, unconscious um, intentions, I think we still have to be very clear that there is still that accountability to a human, to, and whether that is a group of humans in a corporation or a, of a public setter. And so we really need to get down to that accountability. And, and my concern right now as I see AI systems being built is that there are so many players involved in the design of an AI system. And we have such a plethora of open source availability of code that we've really diluted the accountability. That um, if you think of even an autonomous vehicle that has an accident, you know, all the different components, many of them open source, many of them without the tracing to, um, you know, original developers, who do you hold accountable? when most likely it's not an individual failure, component failure, but a system failure. Um, do we do as you probably pointed out in the airline industry and hold the, 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 the operator of the airplane or the builder of the airplane or the certain developer of components? Um, so we really do need to get to some understanding and, and, and AI just because of how broad it is in technology and the difference of which, of which it's being used um, I do think that there is a, a real difficulty right now in really getting to a clear, concise uh, model in regards to accountability, which is needed to, to really enforce it within a regulatory and, and legal perspective. Um, I certainly agree with, with uh, all the points you made in regards to some of the barriers that are in place. I just thought I might um, respond to a couple of them. Um, certainly the, the short-term pressures and, and the pressures on speed, but I completely agree with you that, that what a lot of the sponsors and developers of AI are, are maybe now starting to experience is that this deficit in trust um, or moral uh, debt is actually holding back the, the, the opportunities of AI. Um, if you think back to what the projections were a couple of years ago on the growth of AI and, and just how fast it was going to proliferate and, and just how we were, far we were going to see it in our society, even today it is not materialized. And I, th I think that's because I'm seeing, um, despite what's happening in academia and, and all these opp potential opportunities, I'm not seeing them materialize as quickly as everyone anticipated. And I think it's all down to the mistrust in the technology and so I completely agree with you that um, correcting this moral debt, um, creating this trust at very, many different levels is required if we want to accelerate the use of AI. So I'm a huge proponent in trying to recast data and ethics as an accelerant of AI and not a, 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 a bounding it or, or creating barriers but instead allowing for it to actually come into its, its full um, its full opportunity. Um, the, the, the one last thing that I just wanted to say is that I would have added, and I think I, I kind of opened about this, that another barrier that I would add to your, your presentation would be on getting that agreement on morals. Um, I do think that's really important and, it's, and, and there's a very different definitions um, at many different levels, whether you look at geography, um, the participant within an AI life cycle, the, 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 whether you're public or corporate or um, you know, a user. And so I think that is a huge, significant barrier that we need to kind of resolve. So um, I, I don't know how, I think I've kind of gone way over my time, um, Dominique. So I, I know I talked quickly, but there was just so much great stuff there to kind of respond to, but uh, maybe I've given some additional thoughts around uh, what we heard from Shannon and, and maybe might um, get some additional questions from the group as to some of these lines of thought. All right, thank you very much, uh, Cathy, and don't worry about that. We we know uh, we know the feeling, so there's no there's no problem whatsoever. Okay, our our second uh, comment is uh, will come from Jocelyn Macleu. So Jocelyn is a philosophy professor at uh, Laval University in uh, Quebec City. He has a long-standing interest in issues related to value, value pluralism, political liberalism, public reason, secularism freedom of conscience and religion and multiculturalism. 
Uh, but in the last few years, um, his research uh, focus and interests have also been pretty much oriented towards the theoretical and practical issues raised by progress in artificial intelligence, as well as the legalization of medical assistance in dying. So that would be voluntary euthanasia uh, in Quebec and Canada, uh, but also question regarding uh, human finitude, personal identity, and uh, decision making at the end of life. I should also point out, so you may have seen or heard Justin uh, uh, speak before because he has an outstanding implication public uh, debates uh, in Quebec uh, and abroad. He has been involved in a number of public uh, commission. He's also writing columns for magazines and newspapers uh, and collaborated with a few radio, radio and television uh, show. Let me just uh, finish by saying that according to your website, uh, Jocelyn, you are not one to live only on thought experiments and metaphysic metaphysically possible worlds. Rather, you like to draw upon technical philosophical reflection in order to think about our current predicament and participate in our collective uh, deliberation. So that strike me as being very wise uh, words. So I will uh, let you now in light of these comments, uh, say a few words to Shannon and all of us. Uh, there you go, you should be able to speak now. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Uh, uh, one of my uh, grad students just developed that website and I thought that no one had, saw, had seen it uh, so far. So uh, so good, it's, it's there, it's public. Uh, um, so, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, thanks, uh, Shannon, for this uh, great uh, talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, like uh, Kathy, I think that I uh, agree uh, with almost uh, everything. Um, I, I, I think it's very important that we find ways uh, for uh, developers and companies to internalize uh, some of the ethical uh, costs of the systems that they put on the uh, market. So it's important to think about, about that. I really like the analogy between the uh, uh, technological debt and the moral uh, debt. Um, I also think uh, that uh, especially uh, current AI system should be designed to uh, support and enhance uh, human uh, uh, virtues and skills rather than to uh, replace uh, them. So uh, I think that I uh, agree with the, with, 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 uh, with the essential of what uh, Shannon uh, said. Uh, maybe there's a, a, a divergence on how uh, we should, uh, or are the best way to uh, to get there, and that's what I'm gonna try to uh, to flesh out. So, um, and you of course can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm um, understanding uh, understanding you as uh, uh, relying uh, quite uh, heavily on. Um, self-regulation uh, by uh, developers and companies and organizations uh, who are developing um, uh, AI uh, uh, systems and other uh, uh, technological uh, systems. And um, so it seems that many uh, of the ways that you're uh, suggesting uh, could be part uh, uh, or ways to really uh, put some flesh on this idea of uh, ethics by design uh, so that ethical consideration should be um, you know, uh, taken seriously by uh, developers and organizations themselves at the stage of, uh, of design and, and, and development. Uh, you uh, also talked about uh, a lot about uh, the curricula, uh, which is uh, which are taught in in uh, engineering schools, uh, for instance. Um, you talk about remodeling the the, the culture or the ethos of uh, these uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, that's why I'm. I'm I'm hearing you as uh, as promoting a form of, of uh, ethical self-regulation by the main uh, actors, um, and it, it it just uh, it came to mind. Uh, perhaps I'm I'm uh, I'm confused. I'm conflating uh, uh, some of the papers that you uh, wrote with, the, but it seems to me that I read a paper by you who which was uh, uh, in part on 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 virtue ethics. Uh, uh, per perhaps that's uh, I'm not sure if that's right, but if it's that might be the the source of our um, divergence if there's uh, one. Um, probably like like Dominique, I'm uh, more. Uh, um, I'm among those who um, welcome uh, the turn towards uh, uh, political philosophy in uh, fields such as business ethics and organizational ethics and professional uh, ethics. Uh, and uh, once you uh, 
uh, once you develop uh, more uh, political philosophy based approaches to these fields of ethics, you don't rely so much on the on the values and dispositions and behaviors of the uh, individual agents or of the corporation or or on their value uh, statesmen and so on so so on but you rely uh, you think that uh, what uh, matters most uh, are the the public norms and rules and policies and laws that are uh, designed and implemented by uh, public uh, authorities. Uh, so that's what I have in mind when I, I, I refer to this uh, uh, shift towards political philosophy among these uh, subfields of uh, ethics. And, and these public rules and norms are themselves based on principles of justice or notions of the common good and, uh, and, and so on. And, and one of the reasons why uh, many of us uh, welcome that uh, that, that move is that uh, uh, it seems to me that we cannot assume that uh, uh, agents, uh, individual agents or organizations, um, well, we have to recognize that they have their own uh, interests and that their own interests do not always coincide with, uh, with social justice or with the common uh, good. Uh, and that uh, given that we cannot uh, assume that uh, uh, people uh, and the organizations and individual agents will be naturally uh, benevolent and, and disinterested, uh, we thus uh, first need to focus on, uh, on public uh, regulation uh, rather than betting uh, everything on self-regulation. Uh, uh, um, so that's uh, one of the uh, maybe one on the one of the points where we might have a diverge divergence. But uh, I want to be quick to add that uh, we should not um, we should avoid a, a false uh, dilemma uh, fallacy. Uh, there is no logical or practical incompatibility between some forms of self-regulation and uh, public uh, regulation. Uh, my worry is that uh, uh, sometimes we focus too much on self-regulation and that's exactly what uh, um, big corporations, for, for instance, uh, want us to, to do, right? Because they prefer to uh, self-regulate or, or, or pretend that they're self-regulating than having to uh, deal with, uh, the, with public, uh, with state uh, regulations. And, and sometimes, but not always, but sometimes it, uh, it comes to nothing more than uh, ethics uh, washing. So that's one of my uh, worries. And that's why, uh, at least we, if we're doing a, a non-ideal theory of uh, AI ethics, that we should give a normative priority uh, to, to public uh, regulation. And when I think about the main ethical issues that we've been wrestling with in the past few years, about what do we do with the, with the, the black box problem, the lack of explainability of the uh, decisions made by uh, AI systems or uh, the, the biases in, in machine learning uh, algorithms or the problem related to privacy that uh, you both uh, mentioned or the accountability uh, issues or the economic injustice that might be created through automating uh, jobs or, or, or tasks and so on. All these uh, issues, uh, of course, they can benefit from a proper uh, self-regulation, but I think that they, uh, at the end of the day, they really all uh, call for uh, uh, well thought and, and demanding uh, public uh, regulations. And uh, uh, finally, um, uh, perhaps also there's a disagreement about um, how we should think about uh, uh, ethics uh, training for uh, computer scientists and uh, engineers. I, I fully support the, this idea that it should be uh, built in the, in the, in the curricula. Um, at the, in my own faculty, we've been uh, giving ethics and mandatory ethics uh, courses to engineers, all engineers for many, many years. And I think that's something useful. I, I'm right now finishing preparing uh, with uh, Sylvain, who's always was also here, um, a uh, AI ethics uh, course, and we hope that many uh, students in engineering and, and uh, computer science will take the uh, the course. Um, but I also uh, think that um, we should uh, recognize uh, expertise in uh, ethics, right? So we should provide a good training. To, uh, to engineers and computer scientists and data scientists and so on. But uh, 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 BA level uh, training in ethics is not uh, enough to address very seriously and sufficiently those great ethical challenges that we are facing uh, right now. We need uh, the skills and the knowledge that comes from 
long-term uh, training and also uh, uh, the, the, the experience of, 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 of uh, tackling uh, very difficult practical uh, ethical uh, issues. Uh, and this uh, requires a, an expertise like any other academic uh, expertise. It's very, very difficult uh, to, well, to understand the various normative uh, theories and and, and, and uh, find ways to, uh, to apply them or arbitrate uh, uh, value uh, conflicts and, uh, and think about the different uh, metaethical issues raised by, uh, by the, our different uh, the theories and, and applied or normative uh, ethics. And, and this just is, is a specific expertise. So uh, like Cathy said, I think that the inter multidisciplinary uh, team is, is important to, to recognize that, that, uh, that expertise. And in my experience in the past, uh, three or four years in the uh, uh, so-called AI ethics conference and so on, it's not always recognized that there's a specific expertise uh, there. And I think that that's something that we should point out that we one cannot improvise uh, oneself as, a, as an uh, ethicist. So I think that's, uh, that's about uh, it. Thanks again for your uh, talk. All right, thank you very much, uh, Jocelyn. So now we'll give you a few minutes to respond. Uh, Shannon and Dell, we will open the, our virtual floor to, uh, to questions. Uh, perhaps if you can um, stick to five minutes for your response to Shannon, if possible, uh, because time is flying by and I would like to give uh, people some time also to ask uh, questions. And let me... Thank you. Okay, can you hear me all right? Wonderful. Um, thanks to uh, Kathy uh, and to uh, Jocelyn for uh, really thoughtful remarks. And I will try to be brief, but uh, substantive in, in my response. So um, I'll start with, with Kathy's point. And I think uh, probably the one, uh, because I, I just agree, Kathy, with, with so much that you said, especially about since we, we right now are waiting for a pipeline of expertise to materialize out of um, uh, higher education that will actually uh, deliver more of this uh, 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 kind of combined technical and moral expertise. We need in the in the short term uh, to use multidisciplinary teams uh, to uh, to pursue these goals collaboratively. And I've been part of such teams, and I've seen them work. I've seen them struggle, um, but they can work. They can work well uh, if the uh, organization is really committed. Uh, and invested in uh, in this uh, to to go to the point that, that Jocelyn made. There's a difference between organizations that want to do ethics work or bring in ethics and social science perspectives uh, to sort of satisfy external pressures, uh, and those that have come to understand it as integral to their mission and their success. And those organizations are willing to invest in it properly, stick with it properly, give people the time and resources and permission to ask hard questions. Uh, and, um, and, and when that happens, it really can work um, to have these multidisciplinary teams. Um, it just does take a little bit longer uh, because there's so much translation work that has to get done in those teams, right? Where someone says, well, here's what I mean by fairness. And then someone else says, well, wait, that's not, I've never understood fairness in that way. And so there's a, it, it does take a lot of effort and, ch and sort of charity uh, in, in, uh, in, in the collaborative effort um, to understand one another and, um, and begin to learn one another's methods uh, and uh, vocabularies, but it, can, but it absolutely can happen. And right now, in many cases, that's the only way uh, that it can happen. Um, with respect to the point about, um, uh, cultural differences in values. I actually do have a part of my talk where I talk about that, but it, there just wasn't really time to go into it. Um, and, and I just think it's one of these wicked problems that has been with the human family from the very beginning. And you're right that it becomes more acute as we travel further and, and more frequently and learn more about other ways of life. Um, but it's a very old problem in, in, in the human family of how to negotiate uh, both individual and group differences in, in, in a moral perspective. Um, I think, first of all, uh, because it's been something the humans have dealt with for a long time, we, we actually do have a fair number, number of strategies. Ethics is constantly being negotiated and discovered together. Um, I tend to think of ethics as a social technology uh, that evolves over time and as a cultural artifact. Um, I don't think ethics is delivered from on high. Um, 
necessarily. I think it's something we build together as ways of living in an environment that is itself constantly changing and asking new things of us if we want to flourish together. So I think um, what we need to do is figure out how we can build um, international uh, and regional collaborations um, and uh, co practices of collective deliberation that allow us to identify the shared challenges we're facing. I think COVID is a, is a kind of brutal test of our ability to do that, one which we're, we're uh, frankly not, not doing a fantastic job at managing. And I hope we learn from that lesson, uh, the need to develop practices of collective deliberation so that we can come together uh, across those value boundaries um, and, and meet challenges that, um, that require decisions and that require policies and that require norms to emerge. Um, I'd also like to say that, um, you know, the ability of professionals to develop their own norms is something we've seen happen in the legal community, in the international biomedical community, where you don't have to wait for countries to agree or cultures to agree because each uh, professional um, community of makers and builders is its own culture in a way. And you see that happening in the AI research community where you see researchers saying, I don't want to build things that have this character, even if my government thinks it's okay, um, or the political party that's leading my government is in favor of it. I, I, I refuse to build systems of that sort. Um, so I think there's also opportunities for the AI research community to take responsibility for itself. Um, and that transitions into the comments that Jocelyn is making about self-regulation. And I think um, my view is that this is not an either or, um, and, and, and you made something at the same point. It's, it's a false dilemma to say that uh, we either regulate ourselves or we rely on laws um, and, uh, and social policy uh, to regulate us. Um, there is no way uh, to enforce regulations in a community uh, that is deeply corrupt and determined to violate all of the norms that your laws are prescribing compliance with, right? Laws only work if the vast majority of the population are motivated uh, to follow the, the norms that are inscribed in them. Um, so we need uh, sort of to cultivate a moral community, uh, but we also need the right incentives for that community and laws and policies provide part of the incentive and guidance structure for that. Um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a check on those actors who would exploit the goodwill of the larger community. Um, so we do need that. Um, I, I do think going to uh, Jocelyn's point that the variability of AI and the variance in the risk profiles by sector, by use case are such that regulating AI is really, really a hard problem at the sort of universal high level. It does have to get very granular. Um, and that's another reason why you need a lot of domain expertise uh, to be developed on the ground um, because uh, regulators uh, even the smartest, most well-intentioned uh, regulators are kind of at sea often right now about how to regulate AI appropriately in different sectors. Um, and so there, we need that expertise within the community in order to work with regulators to shape regulation that makes sense, because laws can do a lot of harm if they're badly crafted. Some of the computer fraud laws designed in the 1980s that were con constructed perhaps with good intentions were actually not well designed or well implemented and, and and there's a lot of collateral damage there so i think we need to be careful uh, to make sure that um uh, that we understand uh, that, that laws are not a silver bullet and the other reason that laws aren't a silver bullet is that it requires that broader community commitment uh to justice that you spoke of um and uh, a, a language a moral language in the community that is spoken um, because laws are only as good as the people who make them uh, and uh, the communities that demand uh, their, um, uh, their proper interpretation uh, and use. I'll just give one example here. Um, the Trump administration last year uh, proposed a modification to the Fair uh, Housing Act and Fair, and Fair Lending Acts that basically would allow racial, uh, unjust racial and gender discrimination in hiring and lending and these, these important decisions. Uh, to go unpunished as long as the uh, discrimination was carried out by an algorithm that was built by a third party. So 
as long as you farm out the work to a third party uh, uh, provider who builds the algorithm for you, if that algorithm then ends up discriminating uh, against uh, uh, people uh, of color or against women or against uh, disabled people, uh, you can uh, hold yourself uh, free of, of legal consequence under some of these uh, proposed changes. And to be able to get away with making the law such that that is possible um, means that there's been a moral failure in the, in the community to regulate itself. So that's why I think you need these things to be developing together. The moral community has to exist and it has to regulate itself, but it also has to be shaped and guided by sound laws and social policy. Um, so uh, I, I look forward to more discussion about how that might happen. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Okay, so now we will um, open for a, for a Q&A. I think you can leave your microphone open, Shannon, if you want, because you may have to respond. Well, do do as you want, but it's fine to leave it. Oh, I can't, you can't do that. All right, I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. Um, yes, so we will open uh, the, the floor for questions. Um, so I see that, so let me repeat again how we will proceed. So if you want to ask a question, simply write your name in the chat. Normally everything that you write in the chat goes to, to me. Um, and then I will unmute your microphone and give you an opportunity to speak. If you write your questions in the chat, your question in the chat, then I will simply ask the question uh, for you. I also want to remind you that uh, this session is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, please refrain from asking a question. Um, and if possible, I would encourage you to turn on your video when you ask a question, simply to make this communication as humane as, as, uh, as possible. But uh, that said, I know that it's not always possible. So there is, of course, no obligation whatsoever. Final point, a lot of people have written comments and questions so far, but I think I will start right now to take names and questions simply to give everyone an opportunity. So if you already wrote something or already wanted to speak, please just repost again. Uh, resend again your name in the chat. Okay, so the first name I have is Anne Boilly. So Anne uh, Boilly, you should be able to speak now and I will also unmute Shannon. All right, go ahead. Anne, can you hear me? Can you speak? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you, Professor, for your talk. It was uh, very interesting. Um, and I had a question, it's actually a question that I had reading your book, Technology and the Virtues, and it's recurring, so I thought might as well ask you directly. So when you talked about the three moral, moral extenders, um, the third one of substituting, basically if we wanted to put it like very simply, if I understood correctly, it would mean to apply technical solutions to moral issues. Um, and you talked about earlier in your talk, um, about um, public and personal practice of virtue as, I guess, and also based on previous work, a possibility for probably not incurring that moral debt. Um, my question is, how can we encourage public and personal practice of virtue while at the same time respecting individual freedom? Um, because I guess my understanding of of that would be that how, how do you encourage people to practice virtue without coercing them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me just say, uh, let me re respond to two things here. Um, so the first thing is um, you uh, describe the third kind of moral extender um, in my talk as uh, applying technical solutions to moral problems. Um, and I, that's right, but I think that also could describe the other two. Um, and so, and, and I, I, I sort of presented them in a way such that the first kind is actually something I view quite positively in many cases. The second is a little more ambiguous. And the third, I think, is, is, is troubling the more we do of it. Um, so I, I want to just sort of clarify, it, it can be a really it can be an unequivocally good thing to apply technical solutions to moral problems if the technical solutions are allowing us to do the moral work we need to do and do it better. Um, and in some cases, so that's the first kind. And then in the second kind, it can be 
good even if the technical system does the moral work for us in a way that we design and, and continue to monitor, um, if there's a good reason why we can't do that moral work ourselves or can't do it at scale and, and the technology uh, can, can enable it. Um, where I get more worried is when we're using technology to substitute for more work by doing some non-moral labor that in some sense covers up the cost of not doing the moral work or defers it or um, replaces it with a different kind of functionality. Um, because then you see the net amount of moral work that we learn to do together declining. And as if you read my book, you understand, you know, part of my concern is how do we continue to develop and exercise the moral muscles uh, that we have that don't work in the absence of constant practice with one another and in our environments. Um, it's a use it or lose it capability, I believe. Morality is not something we are just born knowing how to uh, exercise well. Um, and so I think um, the third kind is worrisome, uh, both because we can often be overconfident in the ability of technology to address moral problems, you know, that technological solutionism, uh, but also because it deprives us over time of our knowledge of how to do moral work for ourselves. Um, the other question, which is your main question about how we respect personal freedom while encouraging the cultivation of, of, of virtue. Um, this is, uh, as, as you uh, probably know, a, a, again, a very old human problem that we have dealt with. And you go all the way back to Plato and Plato's talking about, you know, well, you just can't allow people to listen to certain kinds of music because it's going to degrade their their virtue um, and you have to sacrifice you know the uh, democratic impulse to um, behave in in whatever ways uh, one sees fit by what's by one's own light uh, because the the cost otherwise to virtue is too great um, and then you see throughout the history of moral philosophy different um, responses to that challenge that range from you know, extreme forms of libertarianism that sort of throw morality to the wolves uh, and, and treat freedom in the abstract as the only moral value worth salvaging, um, to forms of moral authoritarianism um, that um, impose a moral shape on people, even if that shape maims the person uh, and, 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 and um, makes them unable to flourish. Um, and obviously, as a virtue ethicist, I believe that the right approach is much more nuanced, sensitive, flexible, and it's a way of understanding that um, uh, freedom isn't uh, freedom is the freedom to flourish as social animals, and and morality is something that we have to learn to exercise well in order to do it. Um, the freedom of a bunch of lemmings to drive themselves off a cliff and fall to the bottom is not a kind of freedom worth saving if we're the lemmings, right? Um, and so uh, I don't have an easy answer to your question because there isn't an easy answer. But the answer is free, personal freedom is one of the things that allows us to flourish and thus it itself is a moral value to be protected, but not in, in abstraction um, from uh, all of the other things that are required in order for us to live well together. And so it's a constant work in progress of how to build a life um, that is that is free but also just free um uh, but also wise free but also healthy all right thank you very much so now i have a question from monica viktorova uh, so i will unmute your microphone monica and the next question after that will be from anne-marie huber oops i'm sorry um right. and thank you dr valor and uh Kathleen and Jocelyn for, for your very, very interesting and thought-provoking um, talk today. Uh, the thing that I wanted to ask, I thought there was a really interesting point um, that, uh, that you made, Dr. Valor, earlier on uh, this idea that we need like both self-regulation and state regulation. And I was wondering, given the fact that um, development of AI is quite globalized now, um, and it's, it's already difficult enough to like regulate um, tech giants like Google or Amazon because they exist in so many different jurisdictions. Um, do you see a role, for example, for like pan-government um, institutions, like ones that are that are not particularly anchored in any one single state um, to make perhaps regulations that might be 
uh, if not like specifically legally binding in every jurisdiction, um, may be incentivized in some way? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we haven't talked about yet um, is uh, international human rights as a sort of uh, broader um, pan-governmental standard for uh, our, our practices. And of course, um, human rights violations go unpunished every day. And so it's not, it's not a panacea to point at international human rights law or, um, or the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and sort of say, well, there's the answer, right? Um, but I also think those are part of the answer because we have, we are not just starting the conversation today about how to meet global challenges. Um, and AI uh, and, and the risks and opportunities that it presents are just one of many global challenges that we have to face as a human family. And uh, the 20th century in particular, um, as a result of two devastating world wars um, that, that endangered the human family uh, uh, profoundly, um, led to a sort of resurgence of, of interest in sort of um, uh, collective deliberation um, on moral grounds um, and, and efforts to, um, to identify standards of living together um, that we can, can broadly commit to. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to turn away from that work um, or ignore the work that has already been done in that area. Um, so for example, I think if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and a lot of the work that's been done around that, um, I think there's lots of opportunities to use that as a benchmark for how well we're doing with AI, right? Um, and if AI is undermining our progress in those other areas, then I think that's a clear uh, sign for the international community um, that we are, are failing to live by our own lights. Of course, there are countries that will not uh, sign on to those priorities or will sign on to them but won't actually enforce them uh, internally or invest in their uh, enforcement globally. And that's an ongoing challenge that we have. And even interpreting what the sustainable development goals or what human rights mean on the ground in different communities is a challenge, right? Um, um, what a right to education looks like in one community can be very different from what it, what it is in another. And some of those differences are legitimate and some probably aren't. Um, so again, that, that's work we have been doing for uh, many, many decades now. And AI, I think, needs to be folded into that work and not treated as uh, a reason to just sort of start over from scratch. Um, although it does pre present uh, some novel challenges that we have to meet. Um, and, and maybe some, we might need to think about some new development goals and some new uh, uh, issues of human rights that might be highlighted. Uh, as AI advances. All right. Thank you very much. Now I have a question from Anne-Marie Hubert. Go ahead, Anne-Marie. You should be able to, to speak and be heard now. Merci, Dominique. Uh, thank you to the three of you. Um, uh, Shannon, you alluded to one of the barriers being the focus on short-term results. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm with you why we couldn't agree more. Uh, we need the financial markets to shift. And there is a number of efforts that have been done pre-COVID uh, crisis on this area. And we were starting to get some momentum with central banks, with uh, World Economic Forum to uh, try to adopt standards that were closely aligned to SDGs. Um, now we're in an era where all governments across the world are pouring a lot of money in the economy. Yeah. So isn't there an opportunity for government stewardship and central bank stewardship in a very different way to remove that barrier that you alluded to? Because if financial markets don't change and don't expect our moral standards, Mm -hmm. um, we won't be able to win the game, but if financial markets start to change and we have a few developed countries and like-minded countries shift in that direction, the global corporations will follow to be able to access those markets. So Absolutely. your reaction on the opportunity? Absolutely. I agree 100%. I think um, we're at a critical moment where we have no excuse uh, for keeping things as they have been when those things haven't been working for us. 
Um, and so we, we have a moment where um, uh, things unfortunately um, are, are breaking and need, are going to need to be rebuilt, which means we do have an opportunity to build them differently and better. Um, and I think in, in, in our financial uh, uh, systems and the market incentives we have, it's vital that we do that. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had um, with leaders of large um, and, and executives in large uh, wealthy organizations, uh, philanthropic organizations, uh, uh, large uh, multinational companies, who will privately tell you how much they wish the incentives were different, but also will tell you that in their roles, they have to operate under the incentives that exist. And the incentives that exist reward uh, short-term uh, um, exploitation of opportunities at the expense of long-term flourishing, even of their own organizations, right? Um, and so, uh, because even their own employees care about their bonuses this quarter, not what bonuses they might receive two years from now um, for a project that might require a lot heavier investment upfront. And that is hurting innovation because the kinds of things that you can build in a quarter are often just not as good uh, and, and not as exciting and not as rewarding for people as the things you can build if you can invest over a longer period of time and be patient and wait for uh, that expertise to mature uh, into, in something, into something that, that really does advance um, uh, the state of, uh, uh, of your product or your service or whatever. So it's not that people, it's, I mean, there are of course sociopaths and evil people who just basically want to uh, exploit the world um, for their own benefit. Um, but that's not what our financial market is built on. Our financial market is built on a lot of people uh, playing a game that they don't feel they have any freedom uh, to change the rules of. And now we have an opportunity, I think, to think about why are these rules not working anymore for us and how do we redesign them uh, to work better so that business remains aligned with the public interest. Uh, because if you look historically at what happens when economic systems fail to remain aligned with the public interest, they collapse, the, econ the economy collapses, you get political revolution, you get economic dysfunction on a scale that even wealthy people are no longer benefiting from, from the status quo. Um, and so it's in no one's interest to continue the way we've been going. Um, and it's absolutely vital that we recognize that right now. My worry is that there's so much anxiety and fear around the economic uh, um, uh, impacts of, of COVID um, as well as the sort of social uh, uh, stressors that go along with that. My fear is that the anxiety and fear will interfere with thoughtful and um, hopeful planning for the future. Um, I think we have to make sure that it doesn't. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so now I have a question from uh, Denise, uh, then myself, and then uh, Oleg. Um, if you want to ask questions, we may still have a bit more time after that. So there's there's no one after our leg on the queue at this point. So feel free to to uh, to write your name or write a question if you want to. We may still have a bit of time after that. Okay. So question from Denise, which is uh, she says a clarificatory question. So I read: What is the scope of moral labor? Are there any boundaries between moral, non-morality relevant labor? And if so, how do you identify them? Is our work to sustain repair society moral? In quotation marks, and it's from the. What was the, what was the last? Can you repeat the very last part of the question? Yeah, is our work to sustain repair society moral? Ah, question yes, mark. good, good question. I'll send uh, it to you, but yeah, through the chat also. Great. Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, it's something I'm currently working on. Um, so talking about using this concept of moral labor in this way is a relatively new turn in my research. Um, it's, it's not a concept I've been employed in this way previously. And so um, to some extent, my answer is, yeah, I'm, I'm working on defining that more clearly. Um, I, I do think that uh, there's a lot of moral labor in society that we don't recognize as moral labor, things that we treat as non-moral, but really aren't precisely for the, the reason um, that the questioner was, was getting at, which is that there's a lot of different kinds of work that are required to hold a society together that superficially don't appear to involve uh, moral labor. Um, and yet I'm arguing that, that moral labor is the kind of work we do to hold ourselves together as social bodies um, over time in ways that allow us to flourish. 
I will say, however, that there are ways of holding a social body together that are immoral. So you can hold people together, at least for a time, um, by force, by threat, um, by, uh, by violence, um, by, um, uh, by gaslighting, by deception. Um, and we've seen, of course, in human history that many social bodies have been united under those kinds of uh, pressures. It doesn't tend to last, and, and uh, it doesn't last because people aren't truly flourishing. Um, but at least for a time, people can enjoy a considerable amount of power um, from holding uh, an organization that they, uh, uh, that they, that they lead or dominate um, through the use of, uh, of, of violence, of, of malice, uh, of, of deception, um, and of pitting people against one another. So that kind of work that holds a social body together is not only not moral labor, it's immoral. Um, but uh, other than that, I think it gets a lot harder to sort through sort of some labor that holds a society together but is somehow still morally neutral um, from labor that is really tied to our ability to recognize our moral obligations to one another. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So now I have myself on the queue. Of course, uh, like uh, most people, I have many questions. I will focus on one more precisely that it relates also to some some of the topics I'm working on these days. But so I, I, I again, I, like everyone said, I almost I fully agree with you uh, on many things. Uh, I think that we need to teach ethics. We need to find ways to better integrate or to repay that moral debt that we're building in technology. Uh, yet it's unavoidable to some extent that true technological development and the increasing automatization of either organizational processes or economic processes, uh, more and more moral decisions will be made by automated systems, um, uh, even if, if whether we want it or not. So once we have done all that and try to correct for externalities, and there are good questions on how to do that exactly, and when we have uh, created better perhaps ethical sensibilities among the people that develop the system and all these things and we have consulted an ethicist and everything at the end of the day we'll still end up with a situation where uh, we have automated systems that take um, uh, morally laden decisions um, so i would i would be curious to hear more about your view on the limits and the possibilities to embed something like moral competence or artificial moral agency within uh, automated systems um, okay. yes so I'm going to push back on part of what you've said, um, but accept part of it. So the part I'm going to push back on, every time someone says it's unavoidable or it's inevitable in the context of a particular path of technological development, I, I want to say, no, it's not. Um, because that falls into, I think, a trap of technological determinism that we frequently use to imagine that technology is something that happens outside of human will, that it's some alien force that's imposed upon us and pushes us. And, and there, are, there are economic philosophies and, and, and other philosophies that contribute to that kind of determinism. Um, but I think we have lots of reasons to reject those. Um, uh, so automated systems don't make moral decisions by accident. They have to be exquisitely designed to be able to automate moral labor. And who is exquisitely designing them to automate moral labor? Humans are. So there's no question to me that automated systems making moral decisions is a choice we are making. Um, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's something we are doing for very human reasons. Now, my argument is that sometimes that choice is a desirable one and a moral one, and sometimes it isn't. And we need to be able to tell the difference. So we need to not assume that the continued automation of human moral decision making is unavoidable, we have to start asking the question, when is it desirable and why? And then in those cases, how do we do it well? And when is it not desirable uh, to automate a, a certain kind of moral decision? Um, and why not? And then how do we make sure that we uh, retain that decision making purely under uh, human power? Um, so I'll just give an, kind of an easy example. Um, the moral decisions that you take every day um, in order to be a, a good a parent to your child, um, 
uh, and a good uh, partner to um, the person or persons that you share your life with in, in different ways. Um, those are decisions that you probably don't want to automate, um, uh, except uh, maybe on the margins in some, um, some, some very uh, um, non-decisive uh, uh, ways, meaning that those decisions aren't decisive for how you care for your child, and they're not decisive for what kind of spouse you are or what kind of partner you are. Um, I think, however, there's lots of other kinds of decisions that we need to automate um, because, for example, there are moral decisions that need to get made faster than humans can think through them. And that's what we're seeing uh, uh, with a, a lot of kinds of decisions that involve um, large data sets where it would be nice if humans could make the decisions, but we frankly just can't process the data that's required to get to, the, to a good decision. And so we absolutely need uh, automation to help us, or in some cases automate that. Um, there still needs to be human oversight. There still needs to be a lot of sort of human moral wrapping around that system because that system itself is not a moral agent. Um, but we can, we can use it to do some of the work that moral agents could do. Um, uh, if we were able to think faster uh, and process uh, more data. Um, so I think it's, a, it's a very much a sort of selective thing that requires immense moral judgment itself. The, the moral intelligence it takes to know the difference between when it's good to automate a moral decision and when it's not is immense. So there's something called the automation paradox. I don't know how many people in the chat maybe have heard of it, but um, uh, Lisanne Bainbridge was a researcher uh, who uh, uh, a couple decades ago wrote a paper uh, when she talked about the automation paradox, which is that automation uh, decreases the total quantity of human labor that you need to maintain a system, but it actually dramatically increases the quality of human labor that is needed to maintain the system because the costs of a breakdown are greater as automation uh, uh, gets deeper into uh, the functioning of a system uh, and a failure can cascade and run out of control and cause much more collateral damage than a human error can. And so you need more human intelligence and I would say moral intelligence are wrapped around an automated system than you do if it's simply a human driven activity all the way down. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so I have one written question and one person that wants to ask a question uh, with only really a few minutes left. So I think if, uh, if we try to combine these two questions uh, okay. and then you can provide a short answer or, or whatever sure. you, you want. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so, so the first question is a written question from Oleg. So I will see that question. And then the next person that wants to, to ask a question is Ewan Wari. So I will unmute your microphone after asking Oleg's question, Ewan. Okay, so Oleg. Question is as follows. What is your position or reaction in parentheses to the following statement, two points, artificial intelligence is the engine of, engine, sorry, of demodernization. And now uh, A1. All right, we should be able to hear you A1. Uh, thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Shannon, for your presentation and Jocelyn, Cathy, for your comments. It was very, very interesting. Maybe it's a too big question, but uh, for, for the last minutes that we have. I was very interesting that the fact that you say that uh, uh, technical depths and, and uh, moral depths are, are not only parallel, they are linked. And maybe can we go a bit further? It, it means that every technical depth have, has a moral dimen dimension and on the contrary, uh, all moral depth have some aspects, technical aspects, etc., and is not the, the two two faces of the same cause or something like that. Maybe it's too big to answer it just right now, but it was very very interesting to see the the links with between these two kinds of depths. Yeah, great question. Okay, um, so I, I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer to the first question. I think my answer is I probably disagree with the statement. Um, but I'm not sure I, I fully understand what's meant by modernization, um, because that's a word that gets used in a lot of different ways um, to cover a lot of different kinds of things. Sometimes we use it to mean progress. Sometimes we just use it to mean 
you know, things moving faster and being more automated, in which case it's almost a tautology, right? That, you know, the, the thing that allows us to do more automation is also allowing us to get more automated as a society. So what is a more modern society? I, I, I'm not sure we have a very good answer to that. I mean, is it, does it follow the sort of precepts of modern liberal philosophy, political philosophy, or is it more an economic notion? So without having a much longer conversation about what modernization is, I can't answer it, except that I don't think that AI is the engine of the arc of human development, um, nor will it be. Humans are, and AI, as Kathy said, is a tool that we use to accelerate. Uh, so, I, I mean, I guess as long as there's still, if we use the engine metaphor, as long as we're still talking about a human driver uh, and a map made by humans, then AI can be part of the engine. Um, but but that's, that's probably as close as I can get. Um, but I wanna res resist the sort of uh, idea that uh, AI is sort of uh, determining our path. Secondly, uh, the other question, again, uh, like uh, a question that was asked earlier, um, this is one of those questions that I'm still diving into uh, in my research and trying to sort through. And as you suggested, I think it's a, it's a really challenging question, the extent to which these two concepts fuse uh, versus just kind of uh, remaining linked. Um, and uh, I think I just have to do more work on, on thinking through, I, I think, it's more plausible that all technical debt has a moral dimension than it is that all moral, all moral debt has a technical dimension. But then note what I said earlier that I even think of morality as a social technology. And so if you broaden the concept of technology far enough where it includes language, where it includes politics, where it includes um, uh, uh, communication, well then, then that statement begins to make a lot of sense. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for the work that I hope to be producing over the next year or two that will try to answer that question in a more, co more coherent and confident fashion. All right. Well, perfect. That's, that's a very nice way to finish. So, well, thank you again, everyone, uh, for all being here, taking time to think about, uh, obviously that very important topic. Thank you, Shannon, again, and everyone. Thank you. Uh, I know it's not always easy to have these sessions uh, online in a completely dematerialized environment. It, uh, it's very different to our natural inclinations. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep you in touch about what is going on uh, next year. And uh, I think that's it. That's it. So Wonderful. thank you again all for, for being here. Thank, thank you. you and, and, and thanks to, uh, to everyone for a great discussion. I really enjoyed it.